So we're kind of privileged to have um, Aaron Clow, and I said it right, correct? Come, and he started a company called Beds by George that makes sleep safety beds. And he happens to just have a daughter who has 1P36 deletion syndrome. So not only, and that's how you got involved, I, I believe, and you'll probably tell us a little bit about that. Um, but it was nice to have him come, and you guys are from Indiana? Indiana, so they didn't have to come. There you go. Um, so he has his presentation, and I will let him go ahead and get going. If you need a laser pointer, it's here. There we go. Uh, this is a nod out to my Ravens fans out there since I've been subjected to looking at those logos uh, this weekend. <clears throat> uh, was it 2013 uh, AFC South Champ? Yeah. No, uh, thank you for having me. And I, I, I really want to put a, a special thank you to the dads that are in the room because all too often um, I talk to rooms of women, which is nice, but you know. Uh, Dads, you play a huge role in this, especially when we talk about safety. And I think you're going to understand what I mean by that. Uh, my daughter, Stephanie, is uh, now 12, almost 13. She's, she's in the room, I'm sure, watching a video at this point, if I had to take a wild guess. Um, when she was transitioning from a crib, we were trying to figure out what is it we were going to do because she needed additional safety. And uh, quite frankly, as a dad, I looked around at what was out there, and I, I didn't like it. It wasn't good enough for my little girl. Um, one of the things that kind of came to a head was we had a rather traumatic incident on a family vacation, um, complete with an uh, emergency helicopter ride to a children's hospital. And while she was there, they, they put her in a cage and visiting her in the hospital, seeing her with the, maybe you've seen this with the skull cap and the, whatever, the, the EG, and seeing your, your daughter in a cage had a, a very a visceral effect on me. And I said, surely there's something better that can be done to, to, keep, to keep my little girl safe. And, and it's important for you guys to understand, I had no intention of starting a company. I, I just wanted a product that would, that would keep my, my child safe. And so I, I started, um, uh, started, started experimenting with different things and, and modifying existing beds and whatever else. And I came up with something that worked pretty well, but not perfect. And so I tweaked it and whatever else. A couple generations later, we have something that works. Uh, some of our therapist friends would see it and say, hey, I think you have something that other families would benefit from. And without belaboring the point, next thing you know, I'm, I'm selling them to people and and then that's my full-time job. So I, I didn't know all this stuff. I just knew I needed to protect my daughter. Guys, this is very scary stuff. And I'm very, very happy that you're here for this presentation. I don't want to belabor the point, but I do want to uh, indicate a couple of, of rather sad statistics. The FDA and Consumer Product Safety Commission, 1,216 incidents of patients caught trapped and tangled or strangled in hospital beds. These are hospital beds. They have the safety sides. One of the things that this really sad is 699 deaths, 199 non-fatal injuries, and 310 cases where somebody caught them just in time. This is a big deal. And it's worse. Uh, we were part of a study in 2012, they did a study in 2012, we were part of a, a, a project following that where they were saying there's a problem, hospital beds aren't safe. And in that, when we were reviewing the data, they had about 2,000 incidences and they discarded 1,600 of those incidences because they said, oh, that's special needs. And so we don't really care. Don't, not to say that they don't care about special needs, it's just that doesn't really... That, that skews the, uh, the data for our studies, so we're not going to study that. And keep in mind, this is just reported incidents. This stuff happens all the time. It's unknown how many are reported because almost no home incidents are reported. This is simply stuff that happens generally in facilities. One of the things that happens at sleep time is falls, falling out. 
And we're dealing with a medically fragile individual. Sometimes those falls uh, can be a lot worse than they would be for a so-called healthy child. But I don't know anybody that says falling out of bed's a good thing. But the most dangerous thing is what uh, is called entanglement and entrapment. And entrapment simply means they get stuck somewhere in the bed, whether it's between the mattress and the frame, or, or if it's a hospital bed, maybe in the, the, the rails on the side, something gets stuck. And it could be as mild as a bruise, uh, all the way up to, we hear stories of dislocated uh, shoulders and banged up knees, uh, up to and including strangulation. Sorry, I don't want to belabor the negative, but just the reality is, this is a very, very big deal, especially in the special needs community. And the worst thing at all is virtually all these instances reported are happening in products that are supposedly keeping these folks safe. There's a lot of reasons for that. Most importantly, a hospital bed or a lot of the products that are out there are not designed to be safety products. That's not what they're designed for. So they have gaps, they have uh, openings, they have spaces. They're just not safe. Or the sides are too low and they can come up and over the side. Um, a lot of families, just like us, are left with saying, what is it we're going to do? So who's a, how do you know if, if, if your child or your loved one is a candidate? Well, we have a number of things that, that we see. You can't just say, oh, somebody with CP or somebody with autism or somebody with 1P36 automatically needs one of these products. Just as we've heard uh, all weekend long, there's, there's a range of, of or, or le uh, levels of, of ability or disability. We go through and we say, well, here's, a, here's a, a couple of common reasons that people might need a safety bed. And if you can say, yes, my child has two or three of these on the list, then they might be a candidate, at least something to be considered. And understand there's degrees of all these things. So how bad is the hypotonia? How bad is the diminished cognition? So on and so forth. But if you do an assessment of, of your situation, I encourage you to think about do I have a safe sleeping solution at home? And one of the things we run into all the time is uh, families will say, well, nobody told me. Uh, my therapist never brought it up. My doctor never brought it up. And one of the things that I go back to folks is say, well, there's no such thing as a sleeping therapist. There's no such thing as a nighttime therapist. You're talking to a physical therapist or a speech therapist or, or OT or whatever it happens to be. They're thinking about waking hours. They're thinking about what's happening. And in a lot of cases, they're never actually in your home. They, they have no idea what happens when it's time to put the child to bed. You guys are the ones that know that. So if you think about that, balance it against and say, maybe this is a possibility, maybe this is something that you should consider. And I will say, as loudly as I can, in no way am I saying that everybody in this room needs one of these products. But if you do, you might need it very badly. Second of all, Parental rest. Guys, uh, raising a special needs child is the easiest thing in the world, and we always get lots of sleep all night long, and we have plenty of energy to deal with the challenges that come up through the day. Actually, we have no challenges. Our life is a cakewalk, right? Guys, we need our sleep probably more than anybody else. Raising kids is hard, period, and you add special needs to it. I don't need to tell you that. I'm just going to remind you. We need our rest. One of the things we hear from families all the time after they get one of our safety beds is moms will say things like, it's the first time I've had a full night's sleep in 10 years. It's the first time I was able to rest because of the peace of mind that came. I was not worried about my child. And that's huge. And by the way, the illustration I have here is Medicaid's definition of a safety bed. There's a lot of things that people try. Um, America's a great place for can-do attitude. I will find a solution. Uh, dads are really good at this, right? We will find a solution. I will come up with something. And some of that stuff is great and some of it's not so great. Sleeping with parents is probably the number one. Unfortunately, uh, you don't have to look very far into the internet and research to find out how dangerous that can be. Uh, suffocation is incredibly common when you have medically fragile folks sleeping with parents. It takes three and a half minutes of deprived oxygen to start having uh, significant uh, brain damage and anywhere from three minutes to six minutes for complete suffocation. Portable side rails. Go to Walmart, buy side rails. They tuck under the mattress. They're a beautiful thing. 
Unfortunately, they're not rigid enough, and it creates that gap, that entrapment that I'm talking about where they actually can get stuck between the mattress and the side. It's really not designed for patients that weigh over about 12 pounds. Most of our situation, that's not going to be the case. The pillows and wedges, sometimes those are great solutions, sometimes not. Mattress on the floor, that may solve one thing, but understand if you have respiratory issues or whatever else, 18 inches off the floor is one of the dirtiest places in home. I don't care how clean you are. That's where all the dander is and the mold and all that kind of stuff. Again, don't take my word for it. It's just, it's just one of those things you can find out very, very quickly if you want to. So it's not a great solution. And incidentally, let me sidebar. I'm an advocate more than a manufacturer, more than anything else, be, probably because I'm a dad first. But I fight this stuff all the time. Insurance sometimes will suggest these different things, which is outside of their what they should be doing. But a mattress on the floor specifically, if, if and we've had this happen where Medicaid might say, oh, you don't need a safety bed, put a mattress on the floor. Interestingly enough, that is grounds for removal of the child from the house from Child Protective Services, if that's their permanent, uh, permanent bed. Do-it-yourself solution. Well, I've seen a lot. Some of them are awesome. Some of you guys do things that are amazing, and I, I, just, I tip my hat to you. Well done. I certainly did it. Um, you guys can too. I've also seen some that weren't so hot. Uh, I've seen situations where they've taken dog crates and kennels and put their child in that. I've seen them where they take a crib and they turn it upside down and they put the crib over the child and they put weights from dad's bench press on top of it to keep the kid intact. I've seen them where they put them in closets and lock the door. There's a lot of not good solutions as well. Because in every situation, we're desperately trying to find a solution because we want to keep our precious ones safe. So I can't fault that, but, I under, but understand there are better options out there. Safety beds, of course, is what I'm talking about today. The most important thing to remember is we're talking about degrees of safety. There's no one solution for every situation. So what I'm talking about may be more than what you need, and that's great, that's awesome. Um, but I'll also talk about how there are a lot of different levels of safety, and you need to assess your specific situation. What your neighbor has may not be appropriate for you. What I have for my daughter may not be appropriate for you. So you guys are the best resources to figure out how much safety does my child actually need. It is not a babysitter. We get blasted all the time because, oh, this is restraint, it's restraint, it's restraint. And the thing that hurts us the most in that conversation is when the families say, well, listen, I don't know what else to do with the child, so they're going to be in there for 20 hours a day. That's not good for the child, and it's not good for anybody. And understand, we're not talking about play pens. We're talking about somewhere for them to sleep. Okay? Now, I'll be the first to admit, that doesn't mean that as soon as my child goes in the bed, she's asleep in the next 10 minutes. I get that. But it's also not somewhere where... I need to do laundry, so I'm just going to put them in there and leave them. That's not the design of this particular product. Let me talk a little about what, a, what is not a safety bed before I get into the safety bed uh, definitions. A traditional hospital bed. Something you may or may not be aware of. A traditional hospital bed, like you go to a hospital and you're going to be in one of those beds, or you get one and it's a home application, it's designed for, for uh, people who are at least five feet tall. Now, everything is designed for someone who's at least five feet tall. So if I'm putting a, a, a 48 inch tall or a 36 inch tall child in that bed, it's not appropriate. Nothing fits. Nothing, nothing is designed correctly for them. And the safety sides and whatnot that come up are not appropriate. They, they never were designed for safety. They were designed for other things. Bed with portable side rails, um, I've already talked about that. Some of these, they tend to not be strong enough. They tend to not be tight enough. Uh, they're okay for temporary things, going to grandma's house maybe, but they're really not a long-term solution in most cases. A pediatric crib. Understand that a crib, by definition, is only 54 inches long. And it's going to have like a three inch or four inch thick mattress. May be appropriate at a certain size, but it doesn't take very long until your child's going to outgrow that. And you can even look at the manufacturer's suggested you know, label and see this is a very temporary solution. 
Something else to keep in mind, a lot of the cribs have loads and things on them that are not adequate for our particular kids. Uh, to put it bluntly, a lot of our kids are very active and they put a lot of stresses and strains on bed frames. And we hear stories all the time where um, have a child who, who may satisfy the, the size and the weight requirements of a crib, but they're breaking rails. And now I have splinters and other things to deal with because they're not designed for the kind of stresses that a lot of the special needs population is putting on those beds. They're not designed for this market. They're designed for infants and toddlers. A do-it-yourself modified better structure may be a great design. It may be fantastic, but it's not going to be considered a safety bed because they have to get FDA approvals and that kind of stuff. And I only bring that one up specifically because we have a lot of people who say, well, I want insurance to pay for it or whatever, and dad has a design or grandpa has a design, he's going to make it, and I want insurance to pay for it. It's not going to work, folks. I'm sorry. Um, but it has to be FDA approved, has to be considered a medical product, and there's standards and whatnot that we have to follow. So it, those would not be considered a safety bed, even if it's fantastic. And again, emphasize this again and again and again, it may provide adequate safety. It may be great for you guys, but for an awful lot of the folks out there, it just is not an adequate level of safety. And let me pause right now and fixate on one thing. So, some folks are saying, well, I, I don't really get it. I haven't really had an incident, whatever. One of the things I throw back at, at, at a lot of the groups that I speak to, they say, well, do you put children in car seats? Well, yeah. Have you had an accident? Well, no. Well, why do you put them in a car seat then? Well, to prevent the possibility of an accident. That's what a safety product is designed to do. It's not a treatment, it's a preventative measure. So you have to think about what incidences might I be facing and I'm trying to prevent those, okay? So what is a safety bed? There's a lot of specific definitions, but I just took some of the big ones, okay? Some of this is a little technical, I apologize. I've tried to simplify it. 360 degree unbroken perimeter on the mattress, meaning there's no openings. You can see either one of these examples, it's going to be uh, completely enclosed all the way around that bed, all the way around that mattress. There's FDA standards of entrapment and entanglement called the seven zones. That simply references how tight the mattress has to be inside of that frame. We don't want gaps. Uh, at least not gaps that are larger. Are we there? There we go. Size need to be about 20 inches above the sleep surface. Hospital bed as a comparison is about 8 inches. Okay, if you want to know how big 20 inches is, just as a point of reference, you're sitting on a chair. The seat of that chair is probably somewhere in the 20 inch range. Okay, so you, the seat of the chair. That's the minimum, they can go taller. Requires caregiver assistance for the user to exit. This is not something where we want this person letting themselves out. That's kind of defeats the purpose. Openings in the perimeter. This is one of those things that's kind of interesting because the definition is two and three eighths, which is the pediatric standard. We have found that's too big. We have found that a lot of our, you know, you guys know this better than anybody, the arms and legs are small. They can get all the way up to their shoulders sometimes and be out in the, out in the room. We don't want that. So the gaps in our particular beds are never larger than three quarters of an inch because of that. Again, it's understanding the market. Whoops. I'm showing two different examples of safety beds here. The top one is actually Stephanie's bed. That's my daughter's bed. Um, uh, complete with her wind-up ducky in the corner and all that kind of stuff. The bottom one is what's called a mesh enclosure bed. This one happens to be made by Pediacraft. Both of these are considered safety beds. I talked a little bit about the con comparison. And I'm going fast, guys, because I want to make sure that you guys have time for questions. So if I'm going too fast, somebody raise a hand and shut me up, okay? Compared to side rails or hospital beds, there's an example of a home hospital bed right there. And you can see some of those gaps that I was talking about. And it's not just gaps 
It's not just this gap, it's the gaps in these rails that cause problems with the gaps here between the rail and the end. They're called pinch points or whatever you want to call them. Hospital bed is typically an 8-inch size. Sometimes they're as high as 10. Safety bed minimum again is 20. We talk about the unbroken perimeter. We can see the comparison very easily. A hospital bed is allowed to have a 4 and 3 quarter inch gap. 4 and 3 quarters. Think how big that is. A lot of our kids have microcephaly. Their entire head can go through four and three quarters at certain ages. So again, there's nothing against hospital beds. They're just not really designed for our population. So then the question becomes, okay, Aaron, you scare me to death. How much safety do I need? What is it I need for my child? How do I select it? How do I do this? And that's a phenomenal question, and I cannot tell you. What I can tell you is some questions to ask yourself. I can tell you some things to think about. Think about your home. Think about who's using it and how they're using it, and you guys can process through yourselves. One of the things that we fight all the time is parents who have not thought through this well enough, and they end up being given or provided something that the insurance company likes or that a therapist is maybe familiar with, but it may not be adequate. And the worst thing in the world is having a safety product that doesn't actually do its job. And then it's not safe. We, nobody wants that. Whether you buy, get our product or somebody else's, at the end of the day, we want to keep these little ones safe, right? So we ask you to ask some very simple questions. Uh, I was mentioning this to some folks earlier. You kind of want to break it down into separate questions. Question number one, how tall do I need those sides to be? Is, do I have a monkey? Do they climb everything? Uh, they're just rolling? Do they sit? Do they kneel? Do they, they you know, kneel, tall kneel, short kneel? Do they pull the stand? All these are different questions you want to ask yourself of how tall do I need those sides to be. And also the side construction, which I'm going to cover in just a little bit. Mattress size. Typically, the, the, most of what you're going to see out there is going to go from crib size, and then jump up to twin size. And a medical twin, by the way, is 36 inches wide by 76 inches long, or you can get extensions 80 inches or 84. Is there a youth bed option? Yes, there is. Do we sell any of them? No. Because insurance is not going to pay for a youth bed because they're going to say they're going to outgrow it and we're not going to approve another one in two years when they outgrow it. So we're just going to jump right up to a twin. Mattress function, however, is a very important question. What we mean by mattress function is some very simple things like, what do I want that mattress to do? Does it have to adjust? Does the head have to elevate for respiratory or for feeding tubes or whatever? Does the knee have to elevate? Do I need the entire mattress to go up and down? Well, I think we'll touch on this a little bit more also, but a separate question. Because what the mattress does is independent of how tall the sides are. And then other things like how much visibility do I need, how much airflow do I need, what sensory things do I need to be aware of. I love this picture, by the way. Anybody, anybody's child ever do this? There we go. <coughs> so go back to the two, two I had before. Let me compare and contrast these a little bit. The mesh side, again, this is not made by us. This is by Pediacraft. It's a great product, been around for a very long time. And there's some other products out there as well. The benefits to this particular product is it's a soft side. If you have a headbanger, for example, this might be a good option because it, it's, everything around it is soft. The disadvantage is it's a thinner mattress. That's a, that's a three or four inch thick mattress. So once they get to a certain weight, it gets a little uncomfortable. And you have some, it's fabric, so it's not quite as durable, it's not going to last as long. There's also some issues with you have mesh, so, you know, think about, I'll say cleanliness to be nice. Uh, understand we sell to the entire special needs market, so we hear a lot of stories about things that they do in the beds, and sometimes it can get kind of nasty. So sometimes that's something to consider for your particular individual. The other category of beds is called a rigid side bed. The rigid side is more versatile because you can do more things to it. You can change door panels, you can uh, change heights and change things like that a little bit more. Uh, obviously, it's going to be stronger. We're talking about a wood or, or a metal product versus a fabric. I already mentioned the cleaner environment. 
and I don't know what you think, but at least to my eye, the bed on the bottom looks a little more homey than the one on the top. Not really a medical reason, but you know, hey, I like it better. So we talk about side heights. I'll break this down a little bit. What I'm showing is a couple of different examples of how side heights are interpreted. Again, the one on the far side there is 20 inches above the mattress. Again, you have to think about it. it's not how tall the bed is, it's how much side is above the sleep surface or above the top of the mattress. The one next to it is what we call a high side bed, which is 32 inches above the mattress, and then you can build from there. So again, these are all beds by George Op or, or, uh, examples, but we have this one here which has the 32 inch plus an extension that gets us up to 50 inches above the mattress. And, and you can also add a mesh canopy or a mesh safety enclosure to the top so we can't have somebody coming up over the side. We pause on that for just a minute. You have to keep in mind fall protection is very important, right? So if somebody is going to crawl up and over a 20 inch, they're falling from a height of about 48 inches. If that door is closed and they, fall, and they, they can climb over. On the 32 inch side, you're going even taller. Now you're falling from a, a, a height that gets real dangerous real fast. So it's very, one of our most common options is to do the 32 inch side with a safety enclosure in the top. Because if you have the, what we call the monkeys, we don't want them falling from that height. That goes from bruises to breaks or other more serious things. Some folks like just the taller side without having the top and that's fine too. Again, we try to provide options for your level of safety. We're not trying to tell you what to get. We want you guys to make that determination for yourself with assistance from your medical team and so on and so forth. Some of the things to consider is not just the physical size of, your, uh, of the individual, but also what their cognition is and other, other conditions that they have, okay? Then I mentioned deck function. I've already mentioned this. I'll go through it rapidly. You can see the example at the top. That's an, that's an example of one where the head adjusts for whatever reasons. Respiratory is, is probably the most common, but also feeding tubes. Um, this is actually kind of a terrible marketing example because um, having mom in bed with the child is wonderful, but not really medically justifiable. Um, that is Stephanie, by the way. The blonde, not the brunette. Also, I show at the bottom here an example of what happens when you have a uh, mattress that can elevate. So this is what we call a high-low function. You can see that. I uh, hope I can get this to work. This right here is the mattress. And it's, an, it's a ridiculous example. But we have that mattress raised as high as it will go. Um, and that's useful for things like changing, doing therapies. Um, helping moms back uh, for transition, things like that. Something else to consider that's not generally thought through. There's a lot of research being done, especially with autism, but it's a lot of other areas as well, is what is the impact of chemicals on our kids? Not just our special needs kids, but all of our kids. And the reality is, this is not a product that they're, they're around just for a couple of minutes. Maybe, I don't know if you guys, my wife is all about, oh, we're not going to microwave plastic plates, and we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that because of the chemicals. There's a lot of research that supports that. Well, a tremendous number of the products that are out there are plastics, a lot of resins, a lot of glues, a lot of things that, you, that may cause concern or issue. And so one nice thing about a wood product is, while I'm not saying that chewing on a, a stick is a great thing, chewing on a stick is a lot better than getting a mouthful of formaldehyde or some of the other things that are present in some of these composite materials that are out there. So if your child is, is chemically... you're concerned about chemical in an environment, that's a factor to consider. Also durability. A lot of the products out there are laminate products. Now guys, I have laminates all through my house in all different places. Um, uh, maybe your desk is a laminate or, your, or whatever it happens to be. But here's the reality. A lot of our products take an awful beating. When a surface of a laminate is pierced, 
it begins to delaminate. You actually have a structural problem at that point because not only are we increasing the chemicals, but now I have splinters and I have other things. Our beds are what we call a high moisture environment, which is a nice way of saying incontinence is real, and so is slobbering and chewing and all these things. So these are things to keep in mind over and above just how tall is the bed. Something else is ventilation, visibility, sensor reduction. I'm showing three different panels here at the bottom. I'm not sure if the pictures illustrate well, but this is a clear panel and a door. This is a vented panel. This is a solid panel. On our particular product, we offer the option to select what you want. Everybody kind of understands clear. I need to be able to see in. They need to be able to see out. Obvious, right? We get it. Well, this is a 360-degree unbroken perimeter, which means there's a lot of dead air in that cavity. We did a quick test uh, at our office. We took an active seven-year-old boy running around being crazy, put him in one of our tall beds, closes the door that had all clear view. We could see him great. Had a thermometer hanging on the edge of the bed. And the temperature went up five degrees in less than an hour. Why is that significant? Well, for certain medically fragile individuals, that can cause seizures, that rapid increase. A lot of our kids have trouble regulating their own body temperature, so they need to have airflow, which is why you have a vented option. Kind of get that. That makes sense. Not to mention the fact that you have odors and whatever else. This one is not necessarily as well understood. A solid panel actually reduces sensory input. Let's keep in mind this is a bed. We want them to relax. We want them to sleep. So by putting solid panels down at the mattress level, actually can help the individual relax and do what they're supposed to do in bed, which is fall asleep. A lot of people look at me funny when I say that. Let me give you an illustration that you may understand. I know I'm the only one in the room that's ever had a stressful day at work. Sometimes I leave the office, I go out and get in my, my truck and I shut the door and there's that momentary because I just shut the world out from around me. I reduce my sensory input. It's a very simple example of what I'm talking about. We do trade shows where we have these set up. We do clinics. We do a lot of different things. And we'll see special needs kids climb in these beds. They shut the door. And it's like they're in their happy place. You guys may have heard of the studies that are done when, when children can define their boundaries well. It helps them relax especially if they have sensory issues. This becomes their safe place. And so by using a combination of these panels, you can create the best possible environment for your child. Okay? Oh, and by the way, you can mix and match these. You don't have to have just one. You can say, well, I'd like to have uh, one clear in the left hand and one clear in the right hand and vented in the middle and whatever. You can mix and match them. It's all about designing a product specifically for your child. Other things that we talk about are like padded interiors. Padded interiors sometimes are wonderful, sometimes they're bad. <coughs> With a lot of our features, there's a trade-off. If you have a padded interior, you're reducing ventilation. If you have a padded interior, it's something that possibly is going to get you know, dirty and you're going to have to clean. So you have to kind of balance out what the best option for your particular situation is, but understand Sometimes, by solving one problem, you create something else that you have to deal with. Not necessarily a problem, but something to consider. We have people say, like on this bed, for example, which is our high side bed, I want pads that go all the way up to the top. Okay, how are you going to see in the bed? Oh, I didn't think about that. So, there's things that we can help you with. We've thought through a lot of this stuff, had a lot of experience. Um, but again, it's things for you guys to think about and process as well. By the way, this is a good opportunity to mention my Amish craftsmen here. All of our beds are made by Amish in Indiana, which is, uh, is really kind of cool. Their craftsmanship is, is second to none. Take a lot of pride in what they do. And if, you're, if this is important to you, obviously made in the U.S. And while the Amish gentlemen refuse to have their picture taken for religious beliefs. The kids have no problem. They're just jumping right on in there. <clears throat> we also think it's important to have a bed that looks nice and looks like you want it to look. And so 
unbelievably enough to me, uh, camouflage is actually one of the more popular colors for padded interiors and canopies uh, in certain parts of the country. You can probably imagine where those are. It's not New York City. But uh, it is something that we do just to make it kind of fun. It doesn't cost any more. It's just something to help personalize that bed to make it match your home because it doesn't have to always be about clinical stuff, okay? I've already mentioned the mesh safety enclosure. This is two examples of a, a tall bed that has that mesh safety enclosure added at the top. Again, the concept is we don't want somebody to come up and over the side. All right? I know everybody's thinking, okay, great, how do I get one of these dumb things and who's going to pay for it? That's always what everybody asks. It's this number one question that we have, who's going to pay for this? How do I get it? Where do I go? Well, it's not a simple process, but it's far from impossible. Medical equipment retailers, which in the industry we call DMEs. By the way, fun fact, it stands for durable medical equipment in case you care. But a medical equipment retailer, that's somewhere you get a wheelchair. A lot of you guys have equipment already. So if you've, if you've already gotten a chair, you've already gotten a stand, or you've already gotten a reverse walker, you're, it's yours, not from the school, that might be a place that you would start asking. But we have 300 dealers, with 300 medical retailers around the country, the U.S. and Canada, that that's where you're going to end up getting it at the end of the day. But how do you get that? How do you do that? Well... The first thing I always recommend is you talk to your therapist. They tend to be the best resource to get the wheels going. It doesn't have to be a physical therapist, it could be occupational, probably not speech, but it's usually physical therapist or occupational therapist is a great place to begin. If they're not familiar with the product, sometimes you can go directly to the, the DME and they can help you. But the point is, even if you're going to pay for it yourself, you still want to get it through those dealers if at all possible. You can go online. There's online uh, retailers, places like AdaptiveMall.com, Tadpole Adaptive. Those are two of our online retail dealers. But the local dealer has an extra benefit to you guys. Nothing against the online folks. They do a great job. But the local guy will generally will come out to your house and assemble it, which is a very nice thing. These things are kind of heavy. But you're going to work through them. If you're going to go through insurance, they're the ones that submit the insurance paperwork. I get this question a lot. Beds by George cannot submit insurance for you. We're not licensed to do that, so you're going to do that through those medical retailers, and they will help you with it. The process, once you and your medical team have figured out this is the right product for us, these are the features that I think that we want, you get that letter of medical necessity that if you're not familiar with, I can unpack that a little bit. But you get a letter of medical necessity, you talk about the clinical reasons each one of these features or is necessary for your child. Goes to the DME, they fill out the paperwork, they submit it to insurance request coverage. Hopefully insurance says yes. The DME orders a bed from us. We ship it to the dealer. The dealer brings it to your house. Seems easy, right? The reality is it can be a fight. It can be a battle just like anything else. Proving medical justification is only part of it. Sometimes we have to edu we spend a ton of time educating funding sources, educating therapists on this product versus that product versus some other product. There's a lot of products out there. Some of them are very adequate for what you need. Some of them are not. Beds by George may or may not be the right one for you guys, and that's okay. At the end of the day, you have to think through what's going to be best for my particular situation. Now I gotta learn not to yell. The number of injuries is dramatic and traumatic. So do not settle. Please, please, please do not settle for something that's not going to be adequate for the safety of your particular individual. Okay? Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I have no idea what our time is. Um, I do have a couple of things up here about Beds by George you can read while we're talking, and so I don't forget. 
I do have some uh, just little flyers up here you can take uh, home with you if you're interested, as well as business cards. And now I'll open up for questions. Over here. Oh, here. What's the range of typical costs? It's a great question. Um, I'm going to let you in a little dirty secret in the industry. Um, I'm only allowed to tell you what the retail cost is. There's nobody in the world that pays retail. Anywhere. Um, I just love how insurance gives themselves their own discounts. They just say, you know what, I feel like paying this much. So the range in price is from about 6000 up to a lot. Um, I think the highest price bed that we've done is right around $20,000 retail. I understand nobody's paying that, but that's, that's what the retail is going to say. Even if you're buying it yourself, you're not paying retail, just so you understand that. Good question. Um, my son has CBI, so he can't really see much. Is there any beds that actually help with calming a kid down that can't really see much because sometimes he's like fussy at night but then he calms down as soon as I get in there and it's like not seeing me scares him but I can't be in the same room with him when he's sleeping obviously well I'm not sure I, I guess the, I'm not I'm not a a doctor by any means um, I guess the question that I would throw back at you is what is it that calms him down is it, is it simply your presence, or is it being in a safe environment? Sometimes it's just seeing me in my presence, and then other times it's being in an environment that makes them happy, like something that has visual things on it. But at nighttime, that's not a good thing because that keeps them more awake. I understand. One thing I will say is we are trained to sleep. Um, there's all kinds of studies that talk about this and it has nothing to do with levels of cognition. We all, the extent to which um, we can go through our regular nighttime routines, have our, have our place, have our special pillow, have whatever it happens to be. And so one nice thing about a safety bed is a defined space. It's not an entire room. Um, there's a lot of big fancy words to talk about this, but it's basically the concept of we all do better, and people with sensory issues in particular, whether it's uh, sometimes vision, hearing, autism, whatever, they do better if it's a defined space. So we'll see a lot of examples personally, and we've seen a lot of studies that talks about if they can have their nighttime routine, they say, I know this is my place, this is where I sleep. It's one of the reasons you don't want to make a bed a playpen, by the way. When you put them in a bed, you're here to sleep. Because if a bed doubles as a playpen, it confuses. I don't know what this is. So if you can have that defined space, they say, yep, I, I recognize this. This is my bed. This is my safe place. This is my quiet place. It helps tremendously psychologically for the brain to begin shutting down so they can go into rest mode. I can't emphasize enough, it's, it's the biggest reason you don't want it to be a playpen. Because then it confuses the individual. What am I supposed to be doing here? Well, and again, every situation is different. Um, maybe. I guess it kind of depends on, on, on what works for him. Uh, I, I wish I could give you a better answer than that. I, I just can't. I, I think a lot of it has to do with just learning what works and you, you're going to know that answer probably better than anybody else. But do I have a magic bolt that says my child's going to sleep eight hours a night? Man, I wish I had that. That's what I should have done. Wouldn't that be awesome? But I don't have it. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've talked about airflow and the, you know the need for ventilation and I can really see that but on a lot of the beds you showed they were really looked very very enclosed I was rather surprised I thought that maybe a couple of well spaced three or four inch vents would perfectly well take care of that um, well 
There's a couple problems with that. I'm, I'm just taking your question specifically, three or four inch events. Um, those aren't allowed by the FDA. That, those gaps are too large. And the other thing we've run into very, very, uh, in very real ways is those gaps are too big. And so they, that's part of the problem with the hospital bed. They're very well ventilated, but the gaps are too large and arms and legs and heads are going through those gaps and creating strangulation and other things. And well, again, mesh is an option. Um, right, right. So the, the, it, it's about balancing it out to find the right, uh, the right mix of things. What we found is with that vented panel, put in appropriate places in your headboard, footboard, doors, wherever, you can find that balance between safety and ventilation. It doesn't have to be a wind tunnel. You're just trying to regulate the temperature to the room. So again, it depends on the situation, but that's we have to balance safety against that ventilation aspect. But that's a great question. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Um, this is not really towards a sleeping solution, but more of a monitoring solution if any parents have. As of right now, our baby still sleeps in the same room with us. But after a certain point, of course, there's no room. <laughs> but what does everybody else use to monitor their children while they sleep or napping while you're doing everything else that you need to do as a parent? Well, since I'm holding a microphone, I'll answer that for us. Uh, we love baby, the video baby monitors. We've, we've got one, the camera's hanging right over our daughter's bed and we carry that portable monitor through us all through the house so you can see and hear. And we've used it for years. We, we wear those things out actually, but that, that's our particular situation. We use just a regular, we don't use a video monitor, but just the audio monitor that we carry everywhere. Yeah. Hello. Um, my son Leo, um, we have, uh, he sleeps with us too, but um, he's four, so he's probably not ready for one of those beds yet. My question is, how, f how functional is that closing and opening? Like, how fast? You know, how long does it take? Because he'll go from being sound asleep to being up in seconds. So for me, closing it and opening, I wonder how fast that is. How fast does it take you to open the door? Yeah, to, to open the top, like when it's fully closed. Great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, by the way, I did not pay him to ask that question. That is one of the single biggest differences between Beds by George and everybody else in the market. And maybe it's because I'm a dad, but that was a very, very important detail to me. So all of our doors open in under a second. There's rules that we have to follow about latching mechanisms. You have to have two independent motions and a bunch of rules I won't bore you with to have it secured safely. But I needed to be able to get in if my daughter is choking or, or, or in a seizure or whatever. I need to get in right now. And the other thing is, I wanted that doggone thing to be quiet. I didn't want to be rattling and banging and whatever else. So the particular design of our doors is um, it's, it's, it's a simple motion and it opens right up. So I, so I say less than a second. If you have to get open less than a second, you really can. Our tall doors, I'll back up and show you. This is, a, this is a door closed. There's a hinge right here. It's a bifold door. Think about your bifold doors in the closet, okay, except sideways. Lay it on its side. This is the door open. There's a track right here. So when you release the latches, it comes open. There's a spring assist. The entire side opens all at once, and you're in the bed. Every single other bed out there, even the ones with the mesh, it's a process. It takes time. It's time I was personally not willing to give up. Um, it's not a specific requirement that there's a time, but I think that was very important, which is why we designed it that way. So I guess I'm promoting my product in that regard, but I agree with you. I think it's very, very important. I had a question. I, um, I'm over here. I Sorry. Hear voices. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I have a bed, so I'm all set on that, but I was wondering if you've, in your experience of, my son is extremely loud, and he yells constantly, and um, plus we're constantly changing his diapers and his G-tubes, and he, there's messes everywhere. Do you have any flooring recommendations that you have found that have been really good and safe with our kids who thrash around a lot? Because we have uh, carpet, and it's so gnarly now that... 
We're I about do. to replace it. I actually do have a recommendation. Um, we don't sell this. I found this, ironically enough, in the trade show industry. Um, but they all, you can also see it in different applications. They use it in playrooms or whatever else. Are you familiar with those? They're foam blocks that are two foot by two foot and they interlock. And, and they use it in playrooms. Um, the heavier duty or ones they use in weight rooms. Those are fantastic because they're foam, so they absorb sound. Um, when crud gets down in the crack, and it will, it's easy to pull them up and clean the floor without taking up the entire floor out of the bedroom. And if you really want to do it, you can put two or three or four layers, whatever you want to do, and it's extremely inexpensive. Uh, they run, if, if you buy any kind of quantity, you can get them for about a dollar a square if you kind of shop online. Super easy to put in. And the other thing for a kid's room, they come in lots of different colors. So you can do yellows and blues. Or if you're creative enough, you can actually do patterns on the floor, do checkerboard or whatever. So that's one idea. Maybe somebody else has another idea that they've dealt with. In general, what's the footprint? What's the dimensions of your bed? It's a twin size bed. So um, with these big corner posts, it's a little bit longer. But again, I said it's 36 by 76 mattress. So you're talking about a bed that's going to be about 40 inches deep and roughly 80 inches long, total out-to-out -out dimension, unless you get the longer beds. I did not mention this. We also sell full-size beds. Um, not easy to get improved by insurance, so we don't sell as many of those. We used to offer queen-size beds, and in eight years we sold one, so we kind of discontinued that one. But twin size is, is the most common, and again, that's going to be roughly 40 by 80. Yes. Right down here. Oh, you got something back there? <laughs> You're right there. You're closer. Do you have to use your mattress with it, or are you able to use a regular twin mattress? Fabulous question. I'm glad you asked. Very good question. It's a, it's a loaded question, and I'll tell you why. The coding for insurance requires us to provide a mattress with the bed. So you're going to get a mattress whether you want it or not. Um, do you have to use our mattress? Absolutely not. You do have to use a 36 by 76 inch mattress though. And here's something that you guys may or may not be aware of, no reason that you should, but that's a medical size. For some reason, the medical industry doesn't talk to anybody else in the world about dimensions of anything. So if you go to Sears and buy a mattress, twin size mattress, it will not be 36 by 76. It will be different, not a lot different, but it'll be different. So instead of 36 by 76, it actually measures, um, you gotta remember this now, it is 75 inches long, and it is a little bit wider, like two inches wider. So it's just confusing. The sh sheets still work, you can use normal sheets, but the uh, Sears, you know, Sealy Posturepedic is not going to fit correctly in these beds. But can you go to a, you know, because the mattress is going to wear out, do you have to buy a mattress for me to replace it? No, you do not. I will comment that, just like anything else, there's grades of mattresses. So what the, the mattress we provide is a, um, what they call a, a pressure reducing foam mattress. It's three zones, um, antibacterial, water resistant cover, so on and so forth. It's kind of a middle grade of the uh, medical mattress. It's not, it's not junk, but it's also not the best, so you can upgrade. And you can also do things like um, gel overlays, or if you, you really have a situation where you have a, a lot of pressure issues, uh, you can do what's called low-loss uh, air mattresses and so forth, things that you can do that work in this. But again, you have to stay in the medical side of things for a mattress to fit. But that's a great question. Um, my question is, is that um, does does like state insurance pay for it? Because my daughter has the child and she has state insurance, so. When you say state, are you talking about Medicaid? Like state Medicaid. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's now, it. I say that, this is one of my anger points that I start twitching. States break federal law on a daily basis. Ticks me off. Um, they're supposed to provide adequate funding, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you right now, certain states are better than others. If you live in Georgia, God help you. <laughs> if you live in Indiana, they do a pretty good job. If you live in Ohio, 
We're currently fighting Ohio right now. They do cover it, but it's, it, it's a constant battle about what they'll cover and what they won't cover. Where do you live, by the way? Kentucky's actually excellent. <laughs> oh, well done. Good for you. Oh, stop. They play basketball pretty well. Right here. What's, what's the cranks on the side of the beds up on the top? Great is question. So these particular examples, is that crank is what elevates the head. You can't have that back. No, just joking. Or angles the head, I should say. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry. Curious. All done. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, we, we have a bed as well. Um, but, um, I gotta know whose bed do you have? What kind of bed do you have? Uh, sleep safe. Okay. Um, our daughter rocks like crazy. I mean, it sounds like she's doing demolition when she's mm -hmm. sleeping. Um, have you run into, or maybe you know of any way that you can maybe muffle that sound a little bit? Because it's, just, I mean, if we, it's on wheels. You know, if we take it off the wheels, it's probably gonna fall apart in a week just from the rocking. So we keep it on the wheels, but it has to be up against the wall, or else it'll be on the other side of the room. Correct. And so. Um, yeah, is there, do you have any suggestions? I do. Get rid of your sleep safe bed. No. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, that's actually a, an important question. And let me comment about that just a little bit. To your, I'm going to answer your question specifically, okay? Um, the mat on the floor does help with that vibration, because what you're hearing is it vibrating on the floor. The I, and if she's banging on the wall, you can put a, something padded on the wall. Um, one easy thing is you know those big, those big half circle rubber bumpers you use for door stops. If you put those behind the door or put them on the, the post in the bed itself, that can help quite a bit. But let me compare and contrast sleep safe to beds by George. What would you guess a sleep safe bed weighs? How much does your bed weigh? Weighs. Weighs. Not much. <laughs> it's a two by two corner post. Okay. And it's, a, it's, all, it's an all plywood product. It's a very lightweight product. Um, I'm not saying it's not safe. I'm just saying it's a very lightweight product. Mm -hmm. Again, I designed the dumb thing. These are things I thought about because of mistakes that I made in my own house. The first bed I had was a JCPenney bed that I modified, and it kept falling apart. And I had the thin corner post and everything else. So this post is a solid 4x4 four four oak corner post. Our bed weighs about twice what a sleep safe bed weighs. Why? Not because I'm a glutton for punishment, not because I want to pay more in shipping, but because these things do take a beating and they rock. So these heavier beds don't move. And that does make a big difference when you're talking about not just the quality, but you're also talking about how it's going to perform over time. I'm not saying it's silent, but, but I have yet to see the kid who can make, because this bed up here, it comes in at about 450 pounds. So I've yet to see a kid who can make that bed walk across the room. Not that that's a challenge. Somebody will challenge me on that. There's a difference. Um, I was just wanting to know what you, you suggest for like visiting friends or coming to conferences, what we should do as far as sleeping arrangements. I know right now we're using a pack and play, but I know they say not to do that. So, Well, there's nothing wrong with the pack and play as long as the child isn't too big for the pack and play. Um, hotels are a challenge. We. We, man, I'm telling you what, I must say we've tried everything. We've tried a lot of different things when we travel to hotels or go to friends' houses or whatever else. Um, I don't have a great solution. All I can say is be creative. We, uh, I, I was talking to some, some folks back there earlier today about this very question. One nice thing about our room is we have a, uh, at this hotel, is we have one of the uh, pull-out couches. Um, you can kind of create forts with those couch cushions. Um, me and my wife remembers a trip we made to Missouri where we actually took the, the fold-out bed and we didn't unfold it all the way. We had, we had it 90 degrees, you know, half unfolded, and that created a nice barrier. And we, but, but it's really about just building whatever you can to make it work. In hotels, beds do move. It's kind of scary what's under the bed sometimes. But uh, uh, in, uh, many times we have taken the bed and pushed it up against the wall 
uh, move the frame and everything up against the wall. The housekeepers always get ticked at us, but we do it anyway. Um, we just do whatever we can. I wish I had a better answer for you. I really. You keep asking the questions I can't answer. Don't give her the mic anymore. I'm just kidding. I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but um, my son's very mobile and physical, and so when we come to this conference and do anything else, and he's on a feeding tube, you know, so it was a big deal. There was this uh, tent system that was like $5,000. So I went to Target and spent $29 and bought a single tent and put an air mattress in the bottom, took the inside zipper um, cord off, because he has just enough fine motor skills to do that, but not if it's just a plain zipper. It works awesome. It's great. He thrashes around in there and it hasn't ripped. It hasn't done anything. And now we say it's sleepover time and he, you know, I mean, he's eight too. So he's at a totally different place than your son is. But um, it, we spent 30 bucks on a tent and an yep. air mattress and it's so perfect. And it's lightweight to travel with on a plane. Yeah, good. yeah we've, we've, we've done that as well at home with the little... And I think well, I saw a post on the uh, Facebook page a couple months ago that Bo Culliver House, they did, he did something with like an inflatable thing with PVC pipe and some like, I don't even know what kind of material it was, but it didn't, they did a time lapse video and I think it was less than like three minutes and they put it up. Because I'm almost to that point with him that right now I just moved into, the house, into a house and we're remodeling the room. And he's in the pack and play. I'm on an air mattress, and my husband's in another room. And he's already figured out how to climb out of the pack and play. And I'm like, all right, let's just not fully get that skill down until at least after the conference. And then we could figure, you know, figure something out from there. But I know I'm friends with him on, on Facebook. So if you want to go through me to get to him, because to, I'm going to say, hey, or I'll give you two, three hundred dollars to, to make me one. I, <laughs> you know, just that way he's safe and contained. So we, I think you have one more, last one, or comment or question, or, and then, then we'll have the transition. For kids that are still smaller than 45 inches and they roll around a lot, but they can't sit up and climb over it, somebody posted about the Intex kids travel bed, and we actually got that for Zoe, and it works amazing. So it kind of looks like a blow up pool, but it's rectangular. And then it's, it's a 10 inch height. So, you know, obviously if your kid can do more than that, then that's not good. But the, the reason we did that, Zoe could sort of fit in a playpen still, but the way she kicks and thrashes, it's, she kept knocking the bottoms out of all the playpens. And that's, sorry, $35 at uh, Walmart. <laughs> I think we are all set, Aaron. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, thank you guys.